Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Um, I see some folks already uh, introducing themselves in the chat. Please feel free to, to say hello and tell us where you're joining us from. Um, what a week of Dafyomi. I don't know about you, but I haven't thought this much about agents in a very long time, at least not the, the legal kind. So this week in Dafyomi, we looked at the question of agents appointing other agents to bring a get. Then we talked about um, the possibilities or lack of possibilities of conditional divorces. Um, men saying, I will divorce you if X or Y does or does not happen. We talked about the presumption that people are alive until proven dead and how that relates both to uh, these two categories that clearly are very similar, uh, divorce and tithing. Uh, right, and here we're talking about, right, that gets us to a discussion about tithing and specifically the priestly tithes or truma, the, the tithes for Levites and the tithes for the poor. That gets us to a conversation about seasonal agriculture and sale, right, thinking about, I don't, I don't know about you, but yeah, you know, we're between Memorial Day and July 4th, which are big sale weekends here, so anyone here who's in commerce knows, you know, when we target particular things. So the Talmud had their own equivalent seasonal sale periods. Then we talked about the husband who tries to annul the get before it reaches his wife. Um, and then we went back to conditional divorces, you can never have too much conditional divorce. And then what happens if the circumstance, if circumstances beyond the man's control lead him to meet the conditions when he didn't really want to? And that leads us to a conversation about tikkun olam, uh, which is usually translated today as repairing the world. And that's really what I want to spend our time today talking about, what tikkun olam means in the Talmud. And actually, I, I, that's kind of a lie. I, what I really want to talk about is what tikkun olam means in the Mishnah. We encounter a number of Mishnahs in this week of Talmud, which address tikkun olam. And I'd really love for us to think together about what that actually means in this context. Um, so I am going to share my screen. And because you can never have too many versions of this, I'm also going to share a link to the Google Doc so you can see it yourself. If the font is too big or too small or you wanna play with it on your end, that way you have the, um, the ability. Um, amazing. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, yes, we're good. Yeah. Okay, amazing, thank you. So what I've done here is I went to the Mishnah sources, um, which are, I just pulled out the Mishnahs from our week of, of Talmud uh, to think about what they have in common. And then what I did is there, these are the Mishnahs in Gitin chapter four. And I only um, took the sentences or cases where the rabbis say, and it's because of tikkun olam. I think if we look at these cases, we're going to get a sense of um, what tikkun olam means in this context. So our first case, and this is the one where we opened up our week together. Initially, one who would con right, one who wanted to annul the divorce would convene a court elsewhere and render it void. And then Rabban Gamliel instituted that one should not do this for the betterment of the world, um, right, for tikkun olam. So this is the, you know, if the get is already in transit, the husband isn't supposed to, isn't allowed to annul it anymore because it might get to the wife, right? And we learned in the daf this week, well, she might think it's valid and remarry, and all of a sudden you've got chaos, right? Once the get has left the husband's purview and is on its way to the wife, it really is on its way. So that was the case where we started out this week. Um, and just so you know, we're gonna do a little bit of preview into next week's um, DAF 2 here. Next case about Tikkun Olam. Initially, he would change his name and her name, right? So if they're known by multiple names, they, he would use, you know, whichever. Um, and then write the name of his city and her city. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, these translations I took 
from Sepharia, if you're wondering where these translations are from. Um, Rabban Gamliel, the elder, instituted that he should write so-and-so and any other name that he has, and so-and-so and any name that she has for the betterment of the world. Uh, right, so make sure, so rather than list whatever known aliases they have, use the primary name and say, and all other names. So that, that's the second case. Any questions about that case before we look at the next one? Okay, I can't see the chat while I'm sharing screen. So I am just gonna say, uh, feel free to flag Mara down or Mara, if you see anybody there, let me know, okay? So far, so good. Great. Um, the witnesses sign on the bill of divorce for the betterment of the world. And Hillel instituted a document that prevents the Shemitah year, the sabbatical year from abrogating a, an outstanding debt, which is called the prose bowl for the betterment of the world, right? So here are these two cases, just for context. Um, the bill of divorce doesn't need the witnesses to sign it. Um, the witnesses who saw it being written don't need to sign it, but now they have to anyways for the betterment of the world. And in a Shemitah year, in a sabbatical year, the, um, the debts of all debts are canceled, except that if all debts are canceled, nobody's ever gonna wanna lend money. And if you don't lend money, then people who have don't have money or who need more money will never be able to get it because who would, right? And there are more people are willing to lend than are willing to just gift large amounts of money. So Hillel instituted this document that's called the Prose Bowl where, um, the debt is transferred to the court and that allows it to be collected on a Shemitah year. Okay, uh, next case, right? And that's for the betterment of the world. Next case, a slave whose master set him aside as designated repayment for a debt and then emancipated him. Then according to the letter of the law, the, the slave bears no responsibility for the debt. However, for the betterment of the world, his master is forced to make him a free person, right? So he is in fact freed and he writes a promissory note for his value. Um, Rabbi Shibun Montgomery also says he does not write, he only emancipates the slave, right? It's not clear who, who is now responsible for the debt. Um, all right, next cases, there are two more. The captives are not redeemed for more than their value for the betterment of the world. Right, this is, uh, you know, do we negotiate with terrorists? And we apparently can pay, for, you know, we can pay to return, we can pay ransom for a kidnapped victim, but only what they are actually worth. And we may not aid captives in escape for the betterment of the world. Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel says for the betterment of the captives, right? If, if, Perhaps people think that, right, if kidnappers think that captives are likely to escape, then perhaps they will make captivity much harder and harsher um, to make that more impossible. Um, and Torah scrolls, tefillin, or phylacteries, and mezuzot are not purchased from the Gentiles for more than their value for the betterment of the world. All right, last case. One who sells his field to a Gentile must purchase and bring the first fruits from that field for the betterment of the world. Okay. So those are the cases in the Mishnah which address Tikkun Olam. Um, let's, let's think about each of these now. What is the betterment of the world in the prose bowl case. What makes the prose bowl case better for the world? Uh, and the prose bowl is here, the Hillel instituted a document that prevented the sabbatical year. And maybe if we can get a couple of hands, we can, uh, maybe we can even unmute some people. Claudette. I think what the rabbis are saying for the betterment of the world is that 
it creates peace if you do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So the world is better if it has peace with individuals. Yeah, I think, right, peace is a really important piece, uh, is, a, is an important factor here where these are ways to sort of get people to get along better, right? On, on a very practical level, right? Absolutely. Um, Robert. Um, so I think that the larger class here is that these are Torah laws that didn't quite work as intended. And the rabbis needed to develop a way to figure out how to get around them and create law that would work better in the case of the Provisal to allow con uh, commerce to continue throughout the yeah. Shemitah year. I, I think that is a cer certainly what is at play in the pros ball case, right? And, you know, this might be a, a question of the ideal versus the real, right? In a world where actually all debts are annulled every seven years, we'd like to think that people would continue to lend money in, you know, year six of the cycle, right? That would be really nice to think. But in practicality, people wouldn't or weren't. And so we institute a way to make that work for the community. Now, the the Torah law piece, I'm not I'm not sure about the next sections because we don't really have explicit um, biblical verses that talk about the repayment of debt through enslavement. But I do think what you're pointing to, right, which is we have these sort of systems that need to work better, right? That need to work better for us. I think that's certainly a lot of what's happening here. Well, so let's think about that next case then, right? The case of the enslaved person who is essentially set aside as collateral for a loan almost, and uh, and then is is emancipated, right? What makes what is better for the world if um, if that emancipation really works? And if you don't want to unmute yourself, I totally understand. Feel free to put it comments in the chat. We can read those out. So Laura says the fewer slaves, the better. I am with you. I would go as far as to say no slaves. Yes. So are they, so Pamela asks, are Hazal trying to address discomfort with slaves? And here, I actually think they're not. I think they're trying to address a discomfort with unknown status, right? So imagine a world where somebody is emancipated and then being a free person goes and gets married and you know lives their life and then it turns out that they were collateral for a debt so are are they still enslaved was their marriage not valid because enslaved men can't perform kiddushi like what what happens to their kids right i think that's what they're trying to address they're trying to address what do you do? Yes, Pamela, right? Pamela writes, they can't stand unknown status. That would also explain what this case is doing in Gittin. Exactly, right? We're trying to think about clear categories. So when this enslaver says you are free, he is free. And now we, we have to pay the debt a different way. And the Talmud's going to debate who now is responsible for the debt. But in the Mishnah, what's clear is unknown status doesn't work. You emancipate him, he is free, and now the debt has to be paid in a different way. Wonderful. All right, now let's move to the next case, right? What, what is better for the world in not redeeming captives for more than they're worth? And again, hands or, or, um, or chat, both work. Why shouldn't we pay ransoms that are exorbitant? Go 
Claudette, yeah. If we do, it may encourage others to do the same act because it sends the value up for the person that you're redeeming and people will profit from that kind of behavior. Absolutely. Leah, is that what you were going to say as well? Yes, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a financial saying, thing, right? Yeah. Even kidnappers understand finances. And if you can make more money on a thing, you're going to do it more. Uh, right. And so it would, in some ways, incentivize kidnapping and then make it even harder to continue to ransom people. Absolutely. Um, aid the captives in escape. That one seems, you know, I think we in we in the in the modern world who watch movies where, you know, people go and save kidnap victims in all kinds of dramatic ways. You know, Liam Neeson saving his daughter multiple times. We would think, yes, of course, you should free kidnap victims. Here the, the Mishnah says, actually, you shouldn't. That you should go through proper channels, whatever those might be, in freeing captives um, for the betterment of the world, or, right, as Rabban Shiba Ben Gamal says, for the betterment of captives, right, to make their captivity more comfortable. Torah scrolls, phylacteries, and huzuzot, right, we don't buy from Gentiles for more than their value because of tikkun olam, what would be tikkun olam there? Why shouldn't we pay more than they are worth? Leah? Okay, I think it's for the same reason. Uh, it encourages exploitative behavior. Yes. And it also, uh, I think there's a, there's a bit of, uh, it could give people the wrong idea about how we put value on things. It could give people the idea that we value the things more than what they represent. We don't worship the scrolls. They represent something. We don't worship our tefillin. It could really, it could put things in the, uh, it, it could create misunderstandings. Mm, right. So we see here both an economic uh, an economic principle, and we see a, a broader values statement yeah. principle. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Anyone else on the on the Torah scroll, Mizuzot, and Tefillin? Okay, so then let's go to our last case. And here, right, if you sell your field to a non-Jew before. Um, before, right, you know, before the harvest, you, you are actually still obligated to go in and buy the, the first fruits so that you can bring Bikuri. Um, and I see Saul has already put in the comments to prohibit selling the field to avoid Bikuri, right? It, that actually there is a real value in bringing Bikuri and bringing the first fruits in recognizing that the first fruits are, are gods. And, uh, and that is, uh, you, you can't get around it with a uh, timely sale, is what they're saying here. Um, wonderful. So, Marky, I see your question. That question is going to open up the biggest can of worms you um, can imagine in the next 11 minutes. And I want to make sure we're focusing on Tikkun Olam today. But if you send me an email, I would be happy to. Um, talk about that more with you, or maybe we can find another time. Because um, it's a great question. Um, okay, so those are the cases for Tikkun Olam. I'm going to stop share so I can see some of you. And what I want to do now is think with you, what do all of those cases have in common? What is the, what is the common thread? What does Tikkun Olam mean in the Mishnah? And, and this is a, not a rhetorical question. I'm asking, based on these cases, what do you think tikkun olam means in the mission? I know we have some lawyers here. So what is the what are the legal principles at play? Gene. Or Jean, I don't I don't know, but I see. Can we unmute? 
Yes. To keep things moving smoothly. To keep things moving smoothly. I think that's a beautiful way to put it, right? Um, and I see Marjorie in the chat has written order, right? That there is something about we need to sort of function. Linan writes, personal benefit has to be balanced by societal good. Yeah. The, uh, Lisa writes, the best for all in the present and future. And Carol points out that what we are also seeing here in some of these cases is concern for the vulnerable in society. Um, I'm seeing lots of really wonderful suggestions here. You know, I think what's interesting to me, what I what I think about when I look at these is, um, and, and this is a lot because of Kabbalistic ideas that develop later. We think about, I think about tikkun olam, and largely I think about <clears throat> mystical repair of the world, right? About uh, this sort of mystical, the world is broken, and we need to do mitzvot to repair it. Um, and, and I see a couple of folks in the chat sort of pointing to those ideas that, that are so important in later Kabbalistic understandings of tikkun olam. But I think what's really interesting to me about the Mishnah is that it's not mystical at all. There are these very um, small, you know, I almost think of these like, little tax law tweaks that are making the world better, right? Oh, if you sell your field, you still owe Bikurim on the produce, right? Or we can't negotiate in X way where we need to negotiate in Y way. Um, and, and Robert, I think this point that you just raised here in the chat is so important, right? Repair of law that didn't work. That just because something was the law and maybe worked in one context doesn't mean it's going to work forever. And so we, we need to, uh, we need to recognize that we can tweak it. Um, and as Elizabeth points out, right, sometimes we think about this idea of progress of like things need to get better, but those are also right that that both recognizes that things weren't perfect to start, and it insists that doing those little tweaks is a holy act, beautiful. So, and then Sharna, I love this, right? Also just don't incentivize bad behavior, right? When people are doing bad behavior, we wanna not reward it. Now, I think then what we see is that, and, and actually if you read today's piece already, um, uh, for my Jewish learning, I think it's Rabbi Seth Gorin who notes that um, that in the Jastro translation dictionary, um, he translates um, tikkun olam as for the sake of the social order, uh, which is very, I think, a, a really helpful note that it's it's actually about you know the social order as we have it being better. Um, and being better in, again, what I would call like very minute tax law tweaks, right? These are tweaks. Does this, do which witnesses need to sign the document when we say all of them? That's contract law, right? That's a minor piece. And so what I want to do in our last six minutes, and this could backfire on me uh, dearly, but, you know, no, no, no pain, no gain or something is I want to think with you about what it means if we, if we treat tikkun olam both as a mystical repair of the world through mitzvot, and I don't want to lose that, but also think with you about what kinds of minor tweaks to our own world would bring social repair, right? What are the, what are the tiny little tweaks to tax law that would make our world better. Because I think very often, you know, I, I don't know about you, I, I read the news and it sounds like everything is not great and it can feel really overwhelming. And here, I think what we see is the rabbi saying, well, here are these very small things that make the world better right now for people right now. And is the world then fixed? I don't know. 
but it's a little better for at least some people. And as so many of you are noting in the chat, particularly for some people who are particularly vulnerable. So I wanna just invite us to think about that, right? What are those minor tweaks to our version of, of tax law that would and I also wanna invite us to think about what would it mean, right? So many of you are noting in chat that part of what this does is set, um, is set those of us who are making the fixes as an example to everybody else, right? What would it mean for us to be the kind of people who are trying to make change at that small level, right? So I see a couple of wonderful examples in the chat, Gary and, I can't see the whole name, uh, say to turn off your screens for 24 hours for Shabbat, right? Uh, a fast from, uh, or a break from electronics would allow us probably to reconnect and, and recenter beautifully. Robert notes, allow place for a respectful discussion of differences, right? Create these spaces where we can discuss difference productively. Marky, I love helping feed the hungry. Yeah, Claudette, I see your hand. Uh, a simple thing, a simple thing is like saying hello to someone in the elevator, you know, mm -hmm. because you don't know what that person is going through today, but it may make their day that it will make the next person happy that that person meets. Yeah, and I think, you know, we could, we can also say in a world where we're so disconnected sometimes, just right. those brief moments of, I see you as another human being. Right. Right, I see you as another human being in this brief moment in the elevator. Yes, yeah. for those who, who wear masks um, in, in public spaces, I think, you know, very often it can feel like nobody sees anybody anymore. So even, you know, just saying that moment of recognition, however that appears, I think is really valuable. Right, what does it mean for us to be the kind of people who do this work? Anyone else? Jean. Can we get Jean unmuted? I got unmuted. Okay. Awesome. To recognize that we have a responsibility to other people. That if we're for if we're on the more fortunate end, mm -hmm. and it's helpful to think that you're on the more fortunate end, even when you're not then you can reach out and do things graciously. Yeah, right, to think about ourselves as responsible for each other, right, in very particular ways. Now, Laura in the chat has given us a very practical example of what that might look like. Free public transit for the poor and higher fees for those with money, right? So thinking here about what are specific policy positions that could help everybody get along? And I think that ties really beautifully into Leah's point in the chat, which is truly listening to people, which is to say, in order to know what people need, we have to, to go back to everybody else's suggestions, be in conversation with them and really listen. What are the things that our community needs? But what I love about this and what I wanna leave us with is so often we think tikkun olam, we think the world is profoundly broken. And so fixing it is a profound and impossible task. And I think what the Mishnah here and then the Daf this week really emphasize for us is, you know, the, the classic joke of how, you know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? That there are these very small acts that we can take to make our world just a little bit better. And that's part of repairing the world. Um, and so whatever those acts are in your own life, I wish you a week filled with acts of repair and some really great uh, Talmud study. Get excited. This coming week has got some really fun stuff in it. Um, and I will um, I will see you all in a month. Mara, do you want to take a minute to? Sure. I, I know you just gave us an intention about repair. Um, and I, uh, I know that there is a tradition on Tisha B'Av to not actually study uh, Torah and Talmud because it's so sweet. Um, so 
the way we're sort of going on uh, about that is on Thursday, instead of our normal Dafyomi review time, uh, or, you know, half hour review, um, Dr. Sarah Runis is very uh, kindly going to teach us for an hour on stories of destruction within Tractate Gitin. Uh, so we're going to wrap that up. The Thursday of Tisha B'Av, so watch your emails. That's not next week. Correct. Uh, so, so thank you all. And uh, we hope to see you before then, of course. And um, thank you all. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.